Sure, so when I'm thinking about uh, frontline therapy for myeloma patients, the first thing that I want to assess is whether the patient is eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation as part of consolidation of initial treatment. Um, the determination trial uh, was a phase three study uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, earlier this year and was the subject of the plenary session at ASCO um, back in June. And this is a study that looked at frontline versus deferred autologous stem cell transplant in the context of RVD-based therapy for newly diagnosed myeloma patients. And what's important about this particular trial is that the lenalidomide maintenance that was used in the study was given until disease progression or the emergence of unacceptable side effects, which is in contrast to the IFM 2009 trial, which was designed identically with the exception that the lenalidomide maintenance was given for only one year. And what that study showed, perhaps not surprisingly, is that when you do autologous stem cell transplant as part of frontline therapy, you substantially improve median progression-free survival. So with long median follow-up over 70 months, the median progression-free survival increased from approximately 46 months for those not receiving upfront transplant versus 67 months for those receiving frontline transplant. Now interestingly, there's not an overall survival benefit that has been seen to date, but I think that that significant improvement in progression-free survival does have clinical significance. So I do think that there's still a role for upfront transplant. So that's one of the first factors that we look into. Now, who's eligible for stem cell transplant? I think anyone that's you know, fit you know, and could handle the toxicities of high-dose melphalan is a candidate. That doesn't necessarily mean that age is a barrier. So fitter patients uh, that are older can go through stem cell transplant uh, quite well uh, with identical overall survival to their younger uh, counterparts. A very nice retrospective analysis uh, through the CIBMTR has demonstrated that point. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that you can go through stem cell transplant if you have moderate to severe uh, renal impairment. Again, carefully selected patients, but if they're fit and otherwise healthy, they too can go through autologous stem cell transplantation with nearly identical progression-free and overall survival compared to their counterparts with normal renal function. So for those patients that are transplant eligible, we are now using four drug therapies for induction over three drug uh, strategies, and that's based on two randomized studies. Uh, Cassiopeia was a phase three study that incorporated the CD38 monoclonal antibody daratumumab into the bortezomib thalidomide and dexamethasone backbone in the context of frontline autologous stem cell transplant. And what that study showed is that the addition of daratumumab to VTD in the induction phase and the post-transplant consolidation improved depth of response and this uh, translated into improved progression-free survival. Uh, the Griffin trial was a randomized phase two study that was designed similarly, um, but this was the lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone uh, backbone. And what we showed in this particular trial is that when you added daratumumab to the RVD backbone in induction, post-transplant consolidation, and for the first two years of maintenance therapy with lenalidomide, again, you improve depth of response, and this now with longer follow-up has translated in to improve median progression-free survival. So I think that there's you know, fairly convincing data at this point that for the fitter transplant-eligible patients, four drugs are better than three. Uh, for those patients that are not transplant eligible, um, it's clear that three drugs are better than two. The SWOG S0777 trial you know, demonstrated that the addition of bortezomib to the Lendex backbone improved progression-free and overall survival for that group of patients. The Maya uh, study was a phase three trial that looked again at daratumumab in the context of lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and that study showed an improvement in uh, depth of response, progression-free and overall survival. And I'll point out that the five-year progression-free survival in the three-drug arm of that trial you know, was 52.5%, which is the longest progression-free survival that's ever been seen in that group of patients. So I think that this Daralendex triplet is emerging as probably the most important standard of care for that group of patients at this point.